Daily news and analysis. We keep you informed and inspired. This is World Today. Welcome to World Today, a news program with a different perspective. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. In this edition, we discuss the 2024 summit of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, or FOCAC. The 2024 FOCAC summit in Beijing has concluded. Chinese President Xi Jinping hosted 50-plus leaders from African nations and leaders from regional and global organizations such as the United Nations, African Union, etc. The summit adopted the Beijing Declaration on jointly building an all-weather China-Africa community with a shared future for the new era. The leaders also approved a three-year action plan till 2027, in which China committed 360 billion yuan, or about 50.7 billion dollars, in financial assistance for Africa. What does the Beijing Declaration entail? How will this summit direct the future of China-Africa relations? For these questions and more, I'm joined by Hannah Ryder, CEO of Development Reimagined, an international development consultancy; Mubarak Mugabo, Uganda journalist at Vision Group. Also, we have Jia Daoxiong, professor of international political economy at the School of International Studies at Peking University. Now, thank you all for joining me on this very important occasion. I appreciate all your、uh, time and also your insight.、Um, in the speech at the opening ceremony of this year's、uh, FOCAC summit, Chinese President Xi Jinping proposed that bilateral relations between China and all African countries having diplomatic ties with China be elevated to the level of strategic relations. He also proposed that the overall characterization of China-Africa relations be elevated to an all-weather China-Africa community with a shared future for the new era. Both two are very long names, but、uh, Hannah, let me go to you first. I mean, what do these types of relations mean, and why does such elevation matter for both sides? Yeah, thank you for having me on the show.、Um, I think first of all, we have to remember that.、Uh, Obviously, China's foreign policy is a, is quite complex,、uh, difficult to understand sometimes,、uh, and of course the same with African foreign policy. And also, it differs across different countries. So, what this has done is to say that actually the relationship between them can improve. That might even that might mean that, for example, they have more、uh, more regular、uh, discussions between the governments,、um, that they have more、uh, engagement in terms of, un- of peace and security, for instance. Um, so there's a whole range of possibilities that are opened up by、uh, this announcement. The all weather is with regards to the entire continent, so it's not、um, individual African countries. In fact, there's only one African country,、uh, Ethiopia, that has、um, that has got an all weather partnership with China, and there's only five countries globally that have that relationship.、Mm. Uh, but the、so、all weather、uh, basically indicates that. The, the, the China and the region are going to be the African region are just going to be that much more important in terms of foreign policy. So China will be taking into account African views even more closely and watching more closely African perspectives on these issues and, and consulting. And I think it also means that there's going to be potentially more cooperation around peace and security, which is also a key agenda issue for African countries.、Mm. Well,、uh, Mubarak, what's your observation on this? One,、uh, thank you so much for having me on the show.、Uh, first of all, I think it's it's.、Um, I will agree with Hannah. This is a very important milestone、uh, regarding the cooperation between Africa and China generally.、Uh, before、uh, this summit, before the action plan was approved, we have seen African countries, different African countries, engaging China on different levels because China has been having. In you know、uh, diplomatic relations with different countries at a different level, by putting it、uh, on the same level, by having all the 53 African countries having the same level of diplomatic engagement with China, it clearly shows、uh, the commitment of China towards engaging Africa as a whole. But at the same time, it also improves African agents. It also a call on African countries to start engaging China. As a whole, as as an agency, 
speaking with one voice and also addressing African issues as highly stipulated in the African uh, Union Agenda 2063. I think it's a great step towards having a one Africa voice engaging with a China voice. I think that's my observation. Mm. Well, Professor Zhao, what does this, these uh, these elevations mean for China then? Well, the all weather, as was uh, explained by our first speaker today, mm-hmm. has its own significance. But the more fundamental issue here is that whether or not such announcements would lead to uh, staying power. In other words, would say, in this case, Africa on one hand and China on one hand, be committed to that. And I would think there are at least two factors that gives us can give us confidence that there will be staying power. It's not just new wording in the expression. One is that the trade relationship, um, China, unless a short of, you know, drastic changes in its domestic economic situation will continue to be a very important trading partner. And that's an, a need-based reality mm. that drives both sides to stay the course of engagement and cooperation. And secondly, I would think in addition to Africa being one voice and China being committed to development, it's that the emphasis uh, or, or should I say the concurrence of African and the Chinese notions of development mm-hmm. is focused on livelihood. It's focused on improvement in the well-being of the individuals of different countries. So both in Africa here in China, it's not a premise upon, let's say, conformity in political systems or uh, allegiance with each other or alliance with each other in, in global political or much less military affairs. So mm-hmm. I uh, I think it, we, we, we have we have a, a good reason to believe that this is it's uh, going to uh, lead to a lot more productive relationship. Mm. President Xi Jinping also suggested while pursuing modernization, China and Africa should mind six important aspects, uh, namely modernization that is just and equitable open and win-win, uh, and that puts people first, etc. Now, in terms of development and modernization, um, now, Hannah, what do you think are the common challenges faced by China and Africa in pursuing their own country's modernization these days? Yeah, well, for China, I think what is clear is that, you know, China has been on a path to development. African countries, too, We've all been on a path to development. However, China's development has certainly accelerated a great deal more than Afri- than most African countries have. And China has also achieved a great deal of industrialization, for instance, um, over the last uh, 40-plus years. So this is the kind of modernization that, that African countries are looking to achieve. It is also, I would say, even when it comes to areas like agriculture, it's not just Moving, it's not modernization that means moving away from agriculture and making it a small part of the economy, but it means enhancing the agricultural sector, modernizing it, bringing um, advanced technologies to it so that it becomes more efficient, more productive. This is the kind of modernization that African countries are looking for. Mm-hmm. Um, and uh, in particular, and again, if we're talking about agriculture, it's where the vast majority of our people at the moment are employed and a lot of our uh, economic Uh, Our economic growth comes from that sector. But of course, we want to grow other sectors at the the same time, but we don't want to move away uh, from this sector where we do have uh, some great um, some some great advantages. So I think that that's the special aspect of of modernization. It it is a it's a new path Mm. um, for both. And, And I would say also China itself is still looking to shift its economic model into a more consumption-based economy rather than manufacturing. And it's finding that sweet spot between the African continent and China. Uh, and and honestly, China is, is perhaps the most fundamental partner to being able for the African continent to really become uh, a, a, manufacturing, a manufacturing powerhouse in the same way that China has. Mm. Mubarak, what about you? Well, uh, I I think uh, one of the major challenges that actually is facing most of these, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
approach to modernization and of course development between the China and African countries is the diversity of the the nature of the African continent. Mm -hmm. It's quite diverse. Mm -hmm. Uh, China, as you know, it's one big, uh, uh, you know, country, uh, big developing country, uh, but it's under one political leadership. And that uh, makes coordination, uh, you know, uh, decision making very easy. Uh, when it comes to China, and, mm-hmm. and especially when it's uh, you're dealing with uh, cooperation in different areas, as Hannah said, agriculture, industrialization, and, and certainly infrastructure development, it is easy for China, for example, to it becomes a little more easier for China, for example, to cons- to have a concession of a of a development project and certainly get executed or implemented. It becomes a little more complex when it comes to dealing with a continent of over 1.2 billion people, but of course it's under more than 50 political leadership. And that in itself delays certainly most of the projects and also delays most of the decisions, key decisions that needed to be taken. But also uh, there is kind of consistency, especially uh, with the leadership, uh, uh, you know, the kind of, uh, you know, the tenure of office of the political leaders, mm. uh, it keeps on changing. In Africa, you have elections each, each year, mm. and certainly it, 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 it creates a setback on who you're engaging with because different leadership in Africa requires different approaches and certainly may also require different needs and also different priorities. So it becomes a little hard for the cooperation to be moving because you're not so sure who is coming to power the next time. So if a project, for example, is considered and in the next election, another government comes into place, would have actually, you may find that they will have different views regarding a certain project. And that in itself creates a stalemate and it affects the cooperation. Mm, indeed. Um, just as you said, China is a big country with diverse uh, geographical uh, and local conditions. Um Africa has many countries, uh, different countries have their different, you know, appeals and aspirations as well. Uh, but um, Professor Zhang, coming to you, um, in terms of the external um, environment or the international environment faced by China and Africa while they're uh, during their pursuit of uh, modernization, what are the common challenges? Well, a really common challenge is that I would think uh, it's already happening for China, mm. and it will come to Africa as well. That is the past approach of industrialization is facing international uh, a global headwinds. Mm. What I really mean is that China came to its position today in terms of economic size, whatnot, thanks in part to the what's generally called globalization, but more specifically, markets in Europe, in North America, Japan, what what not, higher income markets, they were willing to take these made-in-China products. But now, for China, that's becoming an issue, a very real issue. Mm. And Africa may not be spared either, because this whole idea of resilience, this or it's called economic security, on the part of higher income countries, is going to pose a factual a impediment. Mm. So one direction, I would argue, for China-Africa collaboration is actually to design these industrialization efforts and the trade efforts to for two purposes, with two goals in mind. Mm. One is to promote intra-regional trade within the African continent. Mm-hmm. That's very important, because the good old model of Made in Africa, uh, made in China, export to the high income countries, and future made in Africa, high export to high income countries. That has some limitation. Point one. Point two is that we also need to bear in mind, as you said, China is diverse and it has very different levels of development. Mm. There needs to be synergy between different areas of China in terms of their development, trade, investment, and innovation, and the project in Africa. In other words, it would be unwise to look at China-Africa economic exchange in the future as if China was a unified entity and uh, 
one size fits all within the country. Mm. Only when these collaborative projects, trade or investment between China and African economies, also address the regional realities here in China, can those projects be sustainable. Mm. You're listening to World Today. We're discussing the 2024 FOCAC Summit in Beijing. We're going to a short break. When we come back, we'll continue our discussion. As one of CGTN Radio's most popular programs, World Today provides listeners with a strong mix of international news and business. It delivers in-depth analysis of current affairs and one-on-one interviews, bringing you the stories behind the news, not just what's happening, but why. Welcome back to World Today. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. In this edition of the show, we're having a panel discussion about the 2024 summit of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation. Now, continue with our discussion. Uh, These six aspects uh, mentioned by Chinese President Xi Jinping uh, that uh, China and Africa should mind or keep in mind while pursuing modernization are, uh, for the benefit of our listeners, of course, um, Modernization that is just and equitable, that is open and win-win, that pe- that puts people first, uh, featuring diversity and inclusiveness, that is eco-friendly, and also modernization underpinned by peace and security. I'm just curious, I want to go through this question to all three of you. Um, Hannah, of these th- six aspects, which one do you appreciate the most and which one do you think these countries should particularly pay attention to? Oh, I think the one that is, I, I, can, I, can I pick two? <laughs> of course, or um, three. So yeah. <laughs> I think just, just and equitable is really crucial. If you look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, a key principle of those is leaving no one behind. Mm. And I think that applies not just at an individual level, but also at a country level. And quite often, you know, African countries, we found ourselves being left behind by the rest of the world or kind of the afterthought, whether it comes to trade, investment and so on. Um, I think that commitment is really important. And then within country uh, development, which really takes into account the people uh, and making sure that all people get access uh, to uh, public goods, to you know, the absolute basics, you know, electricity, water, internet, etc. Mm. And that that is cheap enough for people um, is really fundamental. So I think um, that one, I think, is, is a key one for me. Second uh, is, is the eco-friendly and green. And we know we live in a world that, you know, development and modernization in the past has been uh, very not green. Hence, we have the climate change problems that we have. And of course, while African countries do still want to where it makes sense, be able, if they you know, don't have other alternative and cheaper technology, mm. to be able to access fossil fuels. The emphasis on development that is green or modernization that is green, um, I think is, is very welcome because uh, we've had so much investment from China in particular in renewable energy, in environmental goods. And so a partnership with China that is focused on um, on green, I think, offers a great opportunity for, for African countries. So those would be my top two. Well, uh, what about Mubarak? What, what would you pick? I would pick uh, the one that actually covers diversity and um, inclusive names. Mm-hmm. Uh, <clears throat> we have had, uh, I've had an opportunity to uh, work on the different documentaries uh, featuring most of the projects, especially that are under the Belt and Road Initiative especially in the East African region. And, and, and sometimes you get to realize that um, when you get into those communities, especially in the different African countries, most some of these projects, especially in the construction and certainly the execution of these projects, they kind of not take so much into consideration of the diversity and certainly of, of, of the, of the you know, of, of gender issues, for example, which are mm. so much required by the, the SDGs and all that. Some of them are not so much women intensive. The gender aspect sometimes lacks uh, in some of these projects. And that in itself, while designing some of these projects and some of these cooperation, you know, uh, you know, actions, it should be considered that certainly inclusiveness is very important, having vulnerable groups also included in some of these 
execution of these projects and also the diversity aspect you're talking about having different countries, different political leadership, different cultures, different religions, and all that. Uh, most of projects that have been worked on, I think they have to be complying with this kind of the diverse nature of those African countries, but at the same time also bearing in mind that the local conditions of those countries is paramount, especially when regarding uh, this kind of projects. But also, second, I would pick the same with HANA, especially mm. projects that are certainly, I mean, this modernization has to be eco-friendly and it has to be having certain, certainly complying with green, you know, uh, green energy and green, uh, you know, technologies that are certainly being shared by the dif- different countries. I've been having quite a number of projects that have been following on, especially with hydroelectricity projects that have been constructed in Uganda and certainly by the East African region. And I think uh, most of the issues that have been raised by the different uh, you know, Western countries have been so much pinning China-Africa cooperation projects as you know, not being eco-friendly and all that. But certainly, if you put it into consideration, you'll be able to guard against that. Mm. Well, what about Professor Jia? Which ones do you, would you pick? This is a long, a very difficult challenge uh, <laughs> mm-hmm. for countries. This is not, I mean, not specific to Africa. That goes through the stage of rapid urbanization. Invariably, you will have change to the environment. Invariably, some communities will get affected more than others. The benefit of fast growth or any growth is not going to be spread out even. Um, on top of that, earlier there was mentioning of the election cycles in African continents. And in many countries, to the extent I know, the elections also involve race, race issues, ethnic, ethnicity issues, and even religious issues. Mm. So it's going to be never, there's never going to be a smooth ride. Mm. And on top of that, solar energy, for example, at least in the user stage, is green, and it can be readily deployed to, uh, uh, inter- it can achieve ready uh, outcomes in terms of poverty uh, reduction, uh, lighting up distant households that are not connected to the grid. But as was mentioned, right, like the large hydro projects in the African continent, the Uganda would not, will still have a power to play. It has to be part of the African energy mix. Mm. And for that, both Africa uh, and China, and including some international uh, investments, uh, investors will have to come uh, to some criticism and uh, how to stay the course, how you balance that. that you know, you have, especially from the developed countries, mm. the civil societies, they have this initiative of, say, this, I don't think get every word right, but I think it's close, leave fossil fuels underground. That basically means, you know, in some ways it can be radically interpreted as saying, yes, you are poor, but for the sake of the future of the climate, please slow down your development, slow down your use of natural resources. Mm. It's not going to be that easy. But I think uh, if we package this, uh, I mean, it's more than a package. We have to think through it ourselves of saying, well, what Africa as a continent is going through, what China, Africa engagement is going through is actually a universal challenge that is along the way of during the process of urbanization, there will we'll, we'll have some, some uneven distributions mm-hmm. of benefits. And yes, environmental protection, green is, but let's try to make it as green as possible. Let's try to avoid the catastrophic mistakes rather than going to the sort of extreme that's advocated saying leave fossil fuels underground Mm. it's not going to be easy yes rather sounds like a rather delicate balance well you're listening to world today we're having a panel discussion on the 2024 focac summit in beijing we're going to a short break when we come back we'll continue our discussion 75 years ago a new chapter in history began a momentous journey of resilience, innovation, and unity. This year, we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. 
Join us for a special series as we speak to renowned politicians, economists, and senior officials of international organizations about their personal experiences and views on the events that have defined modern China. From the triumphs of the past to the promises of tomorrow, we'll explore the milestones, challenges, and remarkable progress that have made China a global power that continues to shape the international stage. Subscribe to the Chat Lounge for the 75 years of China's rise on your favorite podcast platform as we commemorate this unforgettable journey. Welcome back. You're listening to World Today. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. In this edition of the show, we discuss the 2024 summit of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation, or FOCAC. We have with us Hannah Ryder, CEO of Development Reimagined, an international development consultancy. Mubarak Mugabo, Uganda journalist at Vision Group. Also, we have Jadao Ziong, professor of international political economy at the School of International Studies at Peking University. Now, continue with our discussion. I just I want to ask、uh, Mubarak. I mean,、uh, the African Union has a development plan called Agenda Twenty Sixty Three. Can you、uh, explain to us what the main goals of this agenda are, and how does it align with China's Belt and Road Initiative? Well.、Uh, uh- In 2013, I think African countries, especially African leaders, met and、uh, recognized the fact that、um, there was too much effort in、uh, trying to fight against apathy and against imperialism, Western imperialism and colonialism on the African continent. And I think African leaders recognized the fact that the much effort that has been had put. Uh, had been put towards those kind of fights, and according to them, they had already reached a point where they needed to have development and modernization becoming the focus of、uh, you know Africa. And certainly, they coded it, or they 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 coined、uh, the, the, the 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 saying that says the Africa we want. I、mm-hmm. mean. This was a conversation about African leaders talking about the Africa that they envisage and they want to see, or all Africans need to see. And of course, by doing so, they had to identify strategic problems or strategic challenges or bottlenecks that were affecting the African Af- African countries generally. And most of these、uh, African problems. Uh, and、uh, where certainly are rotating around underdevelopment, unemployment of the youth,、uh, you know, bulge, you know, the young people. Africa is hosting, I mean, is having the youngest population in the whole world, and certainly we will have. We, we had issues to do with、uh, underdeveloped infrastructure,、uh, you know, connectivity issues were certainly, you know, still a problem in the African continent. But also at the same time, very important.、Uh, Insecurity or conflict on the African continent was certainly、uh, a major concern for the African leaders. So they came up with that blueprint, which was trying to show how important focusing on development and dealing with those challenges was very, very key. And that's why they packaged it into the agenda as 2063.、Mm. But when you look at those problems and those ideals. When the African leaders were looking for support from different partners, they recognized the fact that yes, whereas they had the traditional Western partners or developed countries were certainly supporting them, especially in the re- revitalization of the conflict of the of the continent, they recognized that the cooperation that China offers、uh, was certainly based on mutual respect, but at the same time did not have much strings attached to conditions,、mm. and it was also. Based so much, remember that was the same year that the Belt and Road Initiative was proposed by President Xi,、mm. and certainly was too much focusing on infrastructure development, especially in the developing countries, and that aligned well with one of the challenges that Africa was certainly battling with, and that was infrastructure development. It was very key at the time, and certainly still very key because、uh, the African Development Bank had certainly ide- highlighted that there was a huge infrastructure. Uh, you know, finding gap in the African continent. Many billions were certainly required every year, which African countries did not have. But certainly, Africa, you know, China's Belt and Road Initiative came into place, and certainly was trying to identify and certainly 
address some of those issues. That's why it was easy to align the 2063 agenda with the China-Africa cooperation. And that's why it has been somehow supported by the African countries. Mm -hmm. So um, these two are matching their time as well as uh, their basic goals. Uh, They try to mm. address issues that certainly were highlighted and try kind of offering a solution to the problems that African leaders were certainly battling with. Mm. Well, um, during the FOCAC summit in Beijing this time, uh, the leaders approved this three-year action plan. Uh, So it was announced that uh, in the next three years, China will work with Africa um, to take uh, 10 partnership actions for modernization to spearhead the Global South modernization. A specific detail is on trade, China has decided to give all uh, least developed countries having diplomatic relations with China, including 33 countries in Africa, zero tariff treatment for 100% tariff lines. Um, so this has made China the first major developing country and the first major economy to take such a step. Um, Professor Zhang, how do you see the significance of this and what does it mean for these least developed countries? Well, the in trade, tariffs is one of the most tangible and immediately effectual aspects of the relationship. Mm-hmm. So zero percent tariffs on imports from designated countries, uh, exporters, is a good opportunity. But the next step towards that is to harmonize all these other issues related to uh, facilitation of trade that actually translate these zero tariffs into tangible benefits. And more specifically, uh, as the South African you know, delegation to the FOCAC emphasized, to work towards what, you know, uh, what's called a more balanced trade. In other words, there ought to be more increase in Chinese import of uh, African products that would help create jobs in the African uh, economies. And that effort, you know, on the part of the importer, Chinese companies, Chinese government regulators can play a role. Mm. But more significantly, I would think uh, African entities, business, government and regulatory, and frankly speaking, international organizations can um, play in, you know, uh, roles that can enable the prospect to happen. It would, uh, the three years will be a fast time to pass. Yes. And uh, these goals are easier to announce, but then now is the time uh, since that's being agreed for the government policies to be translated into uh, actions that to, into in, uh, blueprints mm. for detailed blueprints for in, uh, implementation. And mm. in this regard, I would argue that, especially given that China's pressure in terms of uh, manufacturing, some of the, uh, in, uh, on the basis of compatibility in terms of uh, manufacturing capacity and on the basis of market needs, we should work harder to enable Chinese companies, especially small and uh, media enterprises to relate to their African counterparts on a project-by-project basis. Mm. So really need to think uh, over the long term. The 10 uh, partnership actions also include one aspect on common security. Uh, China announced that it will give Africa RMB 1 billion yuan of grants in military assistance, provide training for 6,000 military personnel and 1,000 police and law enforcement officers from Africa, and also invite 500 young African military officers to visit China. Hannah, in your opinion, how will this help with African countries' security condition? With with these, what we've seen with this FOCAC is is an uplift of many of the commitments that were made in uh, 2021, mm. and this one is is a really good example of that. So um, we've seen a, a larger financial commitment, support from China in terms of um, peacekeeping and and the outcomes that you mentioned. This w- this is important for African countries, of course, as you know. There are a few places in Africa which have uh, ongoing conflicts. We think about Sudan, for example. There have been efforts in the UN 
um, as well as by Afri- the African Union itself to really try to remedy these and, and put resources towards it. But uh, the, a- the AU especially is always, uh, it does really has not enough finance to do what it needs to in terms of peacekeeping. So mm. um, it is very important to have partners like China contribute in this way. Um, and uh, and we, and we've all, there is also evidence that where there are where there are peacekeeping missions from the AU, uh, they are much more successful than even the peacekeeping missions from the UN. So it's great to have China be in partnership directly with African institutions on these sorts of issues. Mm. Professor Zhao, some Western analysts tend to relate China's military assistance to Africa with China's ambition to really forging its own political cloud on on the African continent. What do you think about that? Well, the as you alluded to, even though you did not explicitly say that, mm. these security, uh, comprehensive security or common security cooperation. I'm sure it's going to invite, I mean, it's going to get a lot of negative reactions from NATO or whoever else. Mm. Uh, that because we have a president of China and uh, some of the Pacific Island countries. But it's very important to bear in mind that very much like in South Sudan, as an example, mm. uh, peacekeeping is, is something that invites very diverse sets of responses from the government, host governments, from the societies, from the UN, from other participants. But the, uh, also in South Sudan, the Chinese participation in the UN and AU organized peacekeeping is that it does not stay with just, you know, having the uh, soldiers uh, under UN helmets to walk around. Right. The Chinese approach to that peace building is a combination of mm. security or is security and economic construction. So as we say here in China, right, development is the basis for security and security is a precondition for development. Mm. It may sound a mouthful, but I would think the it's very important for Chinese and African uh, institutions to uh, explain, uh, not just explain, design these projects in terms of the security cooperation realm, to put these concepts, uh, you can say uniquely Chinese concept of comprehensive security, as we talk about, or holistic approach to security, mm-hmm. rather than running into the risk of being portrayed as another one of those operations that sometimes end up actually perpetuating intra-societal and intra-ethnic uh, differences within those societies. Mm. Well, you're listening to World Today. We're having a panel discussion on the 2024 FOCAC Summit in Beijing. We're going to a short break. When we come back, we'll continue our discussion. 75 years ago, a new chapter in history began. A momentous journey of resilience, innovation, and unity. This year, we celebrate the 75th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Join us for a special series as we speak to renowned politicians, economists, and senior officials of international organizations about their personal experiences and views on the events that have defined modern China. From the triumphs of the past to the promises of tomorrow, We'll explore the milestones, challenges, and remarkable progress that have made China a global power that continues to shape the international stage. Subscribe to the Chat Lounge for the 75 years of China's rise on your favorite podcast platform as we commemorate this unforgettable journey. Welcome back to World Today. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. We're having a panel discussion on the 2024 summit of the Forum on China-Africa Cooperation in Beijing. Continue with our discussion. Mubarak, what do you think about this issue? How much does Africa need uh, these Chinese assistance in terms of uh, uh, military and security? And what do you think about these Western analysis that China's um, you know, assistance uh, in military is particularly for the purpose of uh, forging China's own political influence on the continent. 
Well, before I actually answer that, I want to just make a single comment on the issue that was raised by Professor Jar regarding the free trade, I mean, for the mm -hmm. zero tariff that was certainly extended to 33 African countries. I think it's a very great opportunity for most of the African countries because we're talking about these 33 least developed countries in Africa. They have been, um, you know, for example, if I take examples of Sudan, Niger, and Uganda, they were recently struck off the AGOA, you know, arrangement, the mm -hmm. African, uh, you know, the, the AGOA arrangement of the United States because of uh, issues that um, the United States considered undemocratic and that in itself, uh, it creates alternatives for the markets, especially in these least developed countries. And certainly uh, the declaration that was made in Beijing is a plus for those countries because they have alternatives from uh, the ago arrangement of the United States. Uh, going to this question regarding peace and security, as Professor Jia has mentioned, the Chinese conception of, of, of peace and security, uh, <clears throat> and, and certainly it has been so much also uh, evidenced in South Sudan is peacekeeping operations where we are seeing development being prioritized, especially mm -hmm. in designing projects in designing peace and security uh, interventions made, made in, in this area. And I think uh, this developmental peace concept needs to be certainly uh, amplified by China and, and, and African countries uh, because as Western uh, developed countries or major you know, players in the Western world are trying to depict this as China's appetite for more control, uh, or involvement in African affairs. I think this whole development concept needs to come in <clears throat> more. Uh, for example, the programs needs to be designed uh, in a way that actually depicts the developmental peace aspects mm. rather than having uh, to use the same approaches as has been used by different uh, you know, Western countries, especially when they are dealing with uh, cooperation with <clears throat> African countries in regard to peace and security. And I think that will certainly create a difference and will create some kind of, uh, uh, you know, accept, you know uh, acceptability among the African people. Mm. And in this case, I'm not against the EU. I'm sorry, the AU. Mm. AU has done a lot mm. in terms of promoting security yeah. agendas in, Af in the African continent, um, including initiating peacekeeping missions within the continent. Uh, mm. organized by the EU and led by fellow African uh, mi military institutions. It's all good and well, but there are also issue areas where the EU's uh, decisions that may turn out to be a source of, let's say, co controversy among African societies. For example, EU was for many, from the start an active supporter of the International Court of the International Criminal Court. Mm -hmm. But then, as you can see, the International Criminal Court, as it has functioned, uh, does not operate on the real, you know, uh, I mean, how shall I phrase it? Um, the everyday geopolitics or hard power still comes into play. In other words, the International Criminal Court's arrest warrants or indictments sometimes are more directly applicable to an, a developing country situation rather than some other country situations. Mm -hmm. so, yes, there's a lot of conversations to be done, and I agree with the, the uh, previous speaker that the duty is for those African entities, governments, individuals, and uh, departments, and their Chinese counterparts, to really do a thorough job of designing and explaining to a particular African society that uh, gets into this security cooperation agenda, uh, because the power of, uh, let's say, the media, or especially the social media, Western media or not, is so powerful, we should work very hard to avoid this being turned into a source of new controversy. Mm. Yeah, um, Hannah? Can, can I just come in very briefly? Yeah. Um, so I think the key question, and I think, you know, I think many, many Chinese people will understand this and Chinese government too, is that, of course, security is an issue on the African continent in some places, I would say, not everywhere. Of course, we must remember 
everywhere is different. But at the same time, much of the security issues are caused by a lack of development. Mm. So the more that countries like China work with African countries to really achieve development and create jobs for people, uh, to, to really create roots into countries, especially those countries that have been exploited for many years for their natural resources, where some of the security issues are most rife, uh, really build roots into those countries. We had, you know, in every single speech, pretty much by uh, presidents that have been made in China over the last FOCAC, uh during these last few days, the, what the, the phrase value addition has been mentioned, and it's been made most strongly by countries like DRC uh, and, and others, Zimbabwe, that, that have a lot of you know, great resources, but they have been subject to exploitation and haven't been able to do that value addition. So that's what they want from the China partnership. That's what they want from all of their partnerships. And China has a record of really listening closely and working closely with African countries So we hope that that will be something. And by doing that, it should alleviate security issues going forward. Mm. We need uh, really to amplify or promote the dialogue uh, about the relations or uh, the interdependency between security and development for Africa. Uh, Well, we have limited time, uh, but so much to talk about. Um, A very important question I want to ask all three of you is that... um, why is Africa been gaining so much attention globally? Because we see that uh, the United States now has a U.S. Africa Leader Summit. Uh, Japan has Tokyo International Conference on African Development. Also, there's uh, the France Africa Summit. Why is that? How does a peace and prosperous, uh, peaceful and prosperous Africa matter for our world, uh, Mubarak? Well, I think these are some of uh, which which. Uh, it is a reality. It is a fact mm-hmm. that now every major country is now coming up with, um, uh, you know, Africa summits. Mm-hmm. And, and I think this should be, but but the most important thing is that all these summits have come after 2000 when Forum on China-Africa Cooperation has been set up. Mm-hmm. That it is be a very good attribute and a positive result of the China-Africa Cooperation. And that shows you that... Uh, it has been able to deliver results, positive results, and certainly goals that are so much admired by others. And I think that's very important. But also uh, the fact that most of these African leaders have been so much uh, attending some of these summits, especially in Beijing, in Johannesburg, and certainly lastly in Dakar, Senegal. Mm. It has been many were wondering why are these African leaders getting into that? But also it is not actually only stopping on, uh, on just the summits, but also on the focal areas that certainly these, these major powers are, are now changing how they engage with Africa because of the influence that has been created by FOCAC. And I think going forward, FOCAC is going to be like, uh, uh, you know, it, it's going to be like an example, a good example of how other countries are actually relating with the African continent. Mm. Professor Zhao, how would you um, comment on the rising geopolitical significance of the African continent these days? Well, it's partly geopolitics, Mm. uh, but more directly, I would think, uh, the harsh reality is the continuous way, especially when we talk about energy transition, or the pursuit of the green economy, Mm. Africa as a continent represents a good opportunity in terms of resources and certainly the value-added part in the industrialization and also eventually a consumer market. So you, I would think, on the one hand, you have a competition among these different summits. In addition to what you said, listed, Indonesia actually just had a mini FOCAC of its own right before yes. Beijing FOCAC. Mm. So the, uh, the core issue here is the challenge here is how not to with looking at this as another arena for geostrategic competition rather to learn from each other and benchmark you know, the good practices against each other and make this truly deliverable in the interest of the African continent. Africa has choices too. Mm. Well, uh, Hannah, we are having two biggest um, conflicts our time, the Ukraine war and also the Gaza conflict. How have these two conflicts um, changed African countries' perception of the world of Western dominance 
as well as Africa's place in the world? I think、um, one of the key issues for African countries, of course, is they have very specific views as to how these、uh, problems should be resolved.、Mm. Uh, what was good to see in the Beijing Declaration, for instance, was the recognition and the welcoming from China of African、um, proposals and solutions for these issues. Um, but also remember that Africans have actually, African countries have actually suffered from、um, not having, from some of the resources being diverted, for example, into Ukraine and so on, for, for wars that they, you know, hoped that could be avoided. This is definitely a challenge and、mm. a, a, a key concern. So that's again why there is dialogue and discussion between African countries and China on it, and they can also bring these perspectives. To the UN, we've seen South Africa, for example, being the ones that have created the, the、um, took took the case on、uh, on Israel, Israel to、mm. the、um, to the ICJ, for instance, and have、mm. been very very vocal、uh, about the, re- the the right kind of resolution to that. So, yeah, I think it's an area where China and African countries can. Can really try to make a stronger impact on peace in the rest of the world.、Mm. Mubarak, what's your observation on this? How have the two conflicts、uh, changed Africa's perception of the world and Africa's place in it? These two conflicts certainly are not so much different from the nature of conflicts that have been in Africa for the last fifty plus years.、Mm. That puts Africa in a place where they understand what exactly is going on in Gaza and understand what.、Uh, In, it go, goes on in Ukraine and certainly Russian conflict, and、uh, the positions taken by the Western countries, especially, are not so much different from the positions that are taken during conflicts on the African continent. The position the U.S. is taking, especially regarding the conflict in、uh, in, in Ukraine, is not so much different from the decision or the perception they had in the conflict. Was going on in Libya on the African continent, so it's 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 it puts Africa into a position of understanding the conflicts from the recipient point of view from a practical way, and that in itself, you know, that's why actually you have South Africa, as Hannah is saying, going to the International Court of Justice,、mm. and certainly having to stand with、uh, the Palestinian people, especially during this conflict, because. There is an external hand, and certainly majority, or no, if not all, of the conflicts that have happened on the continent of Africa have had this kind of external forces, especially coming in from the Western world. So that in itself puts Africa in a position where they have to、uh, look elsewhere, not looking at where the sources of these conflicts are coming from.、Mm. So much to explore on China-Africa relations and、uh, the future of the African continent. But、uh, that's all the time we have for this edition of World Today. Again, I want to thank our guests. They are Hannah Ryder, CEO of Development Reimagined, an international development consultancy; Mubarak Mugabo, Uganda journalist at Vision Group; also Zhao Daozhong, professor of international political economy at the School of International Studies at Peking University. University. If you want to catch up with more of our discussions, you can find our podcast by searching "World Today." You can also follow us on the X platform at CGTN Radio. I'm Liu Kun in Beijing. Thank you for staying with us. Bye for now.